this is so wonderful to be here in a hybrid situation after spending so many months now on so many Zoom calls. So I'm really pleased. And I know <laughs> our two um, uh, um, panelists here in, in, in real life are also um, excited too. So yes, yeah, so thanks for the introduction. So here we are um, to talk about death is just a technical problem. Well, is it? So we're going to explore that question and explore the whole idea of living forever and up to 180 and all these sorts of things that people are talking about in the media. So just a couple of words about myself before I hand over and introduce you to the panelists. So I wear lots of different hats, but I've been absolutely fascinated. And this is after studying genetics many, many years ago with the whole evolving longevity industry, what it means to have a healthier, longer life. And of course, the pandemic has um, uh, has impacted so much of how we think about this space. And I have been, uh, I, and really I'm fascinated by the system change that we need to see. And this is working with government, industry, science, public sector to really sort of re-gear the whole machinery around living a healthier, longer life. And I know there are far more people writing books and reading them at the moment, but I was allowed to plug my book just briefly, <laughs> Live Longer with AI, which essentially, to, and it's available on the COGX bookshop as well, um, which was uh, has been out for a few months now. It's on Amazon as well. But it was really about this uh, telling the story and the journey of how, you know, getting to grips with what this whole field is about and the role of AI and actually helping us live longer, healthier lives. So we're going to uh, explore that in more detail. Um, I'll stop there, um, but I'm going to hand over and uh, give our panelists a chance to kind of give their perspective on this whole question of death is just a technical problem. Do we want to live to 180 and beyond? So I'm going to hand over first to Robbie, who, Robbie Stamp, who will tell a little bit more about CEO of BIOS International AI ethicist and expert and historian and philosopher. So over to you, Robbie, first. <laughs> Thank you, Tina. Um, hi, everybody. Um, and hi, everybody out there in data virtual space as well. Um, so uh, as I was preparing for the session, I, I thought, wh where, where, where would I start? And I thought I'd start with the, the work that we do at BARS just simply is always been deeply interested in the nature of human judgment and decision making in uncertainty. Uh, it was a company founded by my mother. Uh, my mother still works full time. And I always rush to say at that moment, as you may be looking at me and thinking, how old are you, mate? And just how long are you planning to keep your mum at work for? <laughs> um, my, my mom was only 20 when I was born. So sort of, she's in her early 80s and is a, is a force of nature. And we've, I've grown up in a way being interested in thinking about human embodiment, sense making. And I, I was lucky enough to spend some time with a, a movie deal at Sony and HBO writing some stories and there's a something that if we think about mortality I, I often think when in all of our shared ancestry all of us the ancestors we all share the ancestors we share at what moment did they have that sense of I am and then how quickly did that next thought but I shall not always be and into that gap has come poetry art religion everything that goes in very many ways to the heart of who we are. So I'm just going to finish my, my introductory piece with just a little bit of a quote as I was looking from Gilgamesh. Now, Gilgamesh is, as probably you all know, just about the oldest big epic apart from some of the Egyptian papyrus texts that we know. Um, and it's about immortality. So we've been thinking about this a very long time. Um, and it says life, so this is the gods, saying to Gilgamesh, uh-uh, <laughs> you're, not, you're not getting immortality, he's gone looking for it. Life which you look for, you will never find. For when the gods created man and woman, they let death be her share and life withheld in their own hands. So I guess I'm here today to sort of frame it philosophically and to think this question through about being this cusp generation of sapiens where we are starting to know more there's a new kind of epistemology about who we are, our health, our internal interoception and working. And my interest is in how quickly that also allows greater agency. So does our, our new knowledge outrun agency, outrun our capacity to do something with this new information? So I'm, I'm going to stop there, but that's kind of the framing that I think I've been asked to bring today. 
Thank you so much, Robbie. And uh, and you're absolutely right. I mean, immortality has been in in, in the history books forever and in the Marvel comics and all the rest of it to the present day. So it's absolutely fascinating. Um, So I'm going to turn to James Pyre, who I first met actually when he was um, uh, one of the partners of Apollo Ventures, but now is the CEO and founder of Cabrian Biopharma. And uh, so um, over to you, James, um, to give tell us a little bit more about where you're coming from and all this. Excellent. Thanks, Tina. And just confirming, you guys can hear me okay. Yes, we can. Yeah, I'm very jealous, of course, that you guys get to be together in London while I'm still (laughs) uh, stuck in my apartment in New York. But it's great to be here. Um, As Tina mentioned, my contribution to this is that I run a biotech company, Cambrian Biopharma, that is focused on the biology of aging. And we have a number of pharmaceuticals, so drug development programs, targeting different aspects of the aging process. And the perspective that I want to bring today is a little bit of the collision of what Robbie was talking about, those philosophical elements of how we think about aging as a, you know, something that is alterable with a much more practical and incremental industry, which is the industry of drug development. And so I've spent my career thinking about how we can take these ideas around aging and mash them into this rather rather regulated box of drug development that makes, um, that is how we as a society have made our decisions of what is okay or not okay to put into our bodies to modify ourselves. And and that's sort of what Cambrian, uh, what Cambrian does. And in particular, the perspective that we take on this, on this field is that we've spent the last almost 50 years fighting a quote unquote like war on cancer, a war on Alzheimer's, on all of these different age related diseases, but we've been approaching them wrong. That we've been waiting for people to get sick and then trying to use new medicines to unwind those diseases. And our perspective is that that will just never work. The only way that we will ever uh, get cures for these diseases and by so doing extend human healthy lifespan is actually by targeting the damage that builds up in our body as we age, preventing these diseases and thereby staying healthy longer. So I think of it as an important, but in some way incremental jump from the way that we're existing, uh, that we're approaching these diseases today to a new paradigm that's gonna define medicine over the next century. Thank you so much, James. And uh, and of course, there's an ongoing debate about whether we should even call um, aging a disease. Um, I know there's lots of discussion about how we even need to, need to see this space um, from that perspective. Um, so I'm going to hand over uh, to Peter, Peter Ward, who um, is going to bring us down to earth a little bit in terms of where the reality is in the here and now. And I know we're going to drill down to some of those uh, discussion points later in the discussion. Um, so over to you, Peter, where you see the space. Thank you, Tina. And hi, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, So I'm a consumer tech entrepreneur, um, so I'm not a scientist uh, or come from the medical um, profession. Uh, I built a travel social network which reached uh, 25 million users and sold that and uh, wanted to do something more impactful with my skill set. And so my co-founder essentially uh, changed my entire paradigm on this by once saying to me, what if I told you we could end aging? We were having a pint of Guinness at the Web Summit at the time, and I said, how many pints of Guinness have you had? Um, And he said, no, seriously, I've been hanging out in the labs in the valley, as you do, uh, whilst running my other company. And the stuff I'm seeing is just so mind-blowing that I just think that given our skill sets, and he was like in the founding team of Badoo, a large dating site, um, I think we can really have a positive impact here. So he had me at that point. And really, his journey is similar to mine and some that we all have faced, which is loss prematurely of our loved ones um, or just uh, people that get sick. Um, And in his case, he had two loved ones who got diagnosed with breast cancer, died within 12 months of diagnosis. My dad had a severe stroke at 62 and died within six years, very severely disabled in that time. And most of us feel completely helpless when that happens. And so we really wanted to understand given this new body of science around aging, whether there was something that we could do to slow or reverse this aging process, this buildup of aging, accumulated aging damage. And so if you think about it, what is aging? It's this loss of function that happens in the body. And what was interesting when we started to talk to these scientists is that we learned that aging is something that is measurable. 
Um, you know, there is a biological age versus your chronological age. Um, and it's something that you can affect right now, today. The difference is no one is measuring it and no one is actually mapping that to the actions that we're taking to know what's working for you or people like you. And so that's what we're doing and what we're building with humanity. It's a consumer app that will help you understand what actions are working to slow or reverse your aging. So I'm very much interested in talking about what we can do today to increase health span, which inevitably will lead to increased lifespan. And I've also seen what's happening in the labs. And yes, Benjamin Button style sort of epigenetic reprogramming is is on the horizon. It's just a question of when and, uh, you know, that's quite exciting, too. Fantastic, Peter. And of course, Peter is a, a, a new dad of his second child. So birth and death are all over in his household at the moment. Um, so, right. um, so yeah, so I, and of course, I, I know Peter through some work that we're actually doing with wearing one of the hats that I wear on the Open Life Data Framework, where we're actually opening up the whole data view of the ecosystem to open up innovation in this whole space. Because we talk a lot about NHS data, but of course, there's all the data in our lives that we need to understand, which will give us the insights to really understand how we can keep healthy and well. So we're taking some some of the lessons learned from open banking, which at, did open up the whole innovation space for the SMEs to the benefit of the consumer. We're taking some of those principles through uh, into the health space. So we're currently on, engaged on this piece of work and Peter's involved in that. So that's a really fascinating, of course, opens up a lot of the um, a lot of the opportunities and potential of uh, using data and AI uh, to develop products and services to keep us healthy and well, rather than just when we're sick. So, um, so I, uh, so we've got a whole bunch of questions that will sort of stimulate the conversation. Now, I know we have our audience here, and what we're going to do is spend the next sort of 20, 25 minutes or so in this sort of uh, dialogue on a few of the critical questions that we wanted to sort of raise in this debate. But please do um, come armed with your own questions. Uh, I will go to the audience at the end of uh, and ask, you know, what questions you'd like to ask us. And uh, and I've just realized I need to know how to see the questions coming from our um, virtual audience. So if someone from COGX can tell me how to do that, that'd be amazing. Um, but we've got some time yet. Um, so just to kickstart the discussion now, I thought what we would do, just because this is an AI conference and data and and, uh, and so forth, I wanted to ask the first question to James, actually, because, um, and I just actually found out today, I saw a piece that has just been, uh, uh, an, um, a piece of research that's just been announced by Oxford University saying, saying you can't live forever aging is unstoppable. So this is a big research study that they did looking at lifespan, both sort of in men and primates and sort of looking at the whole sort of epidemiology of this and looking back. Um, so this just came out and I and this sort of, I guess, introduces the whole discussion about, you know, the, the possibilities of living forever and being able to extend our lifespan, but most importantly, the health span, which I think is is where it's at. So I thought I would just turn to, to, to James, you know, because there is this whole debate about really, can we really stop aging? Aging. Um, and, and I thought it might be worth just explain a little bit about how Cabrian Biopharma, it's rooted in, you know, really looking at the, the hallmarks of aging, which was a, a seminal piece of work published in, you know, a few years back, which kind of laid the scene, I guess, laid the basis for really how we should see um, the different ways in which our, how we age at a genetic, cellular level, physiological level, et cetera. So do you want to just paint the picture just so that people, you know, in the audience and listening to us can kind of understand, you know, the framework for this um, and why it's so important that we engage with this um, because the biology and, uh, and, and the research is just accelerating at such an exponential rate. So I'm going to turn over to you to kind of set the scene there. Okay. That sounds good, Tina. Yeah. And I, I've seen a lot of these articles uh, coming out like this one that that was from this Oxford group, but there have been, I think, three or four in the last few years, and they invariably get picked up by the New York Times or some other papers of record. Uh, and my, I just want to quickly mention, like, that is some of the, the laziest reporting that I see in, in the space. My response to it has in the past has been like, oh, you know, without external intervention, all humans will die before they reach the age of 120. News at 11. Right. This this is not so surprising. If we don't do anything, our bodies are not evolved to live beyond 120. But the reality is that we are going to do something about it. And in so doing, there is no necessary upper limit on how long we can use technology to keep someone's systems working properly. Um, 
And so that is the aim of this whole industry that I call the longevity biotechnology industry, which is formulated around building new therapies, new medicines that target the damage that builds up in our bodies that causes us to break down and ultimately get disease in, in our old age, which are the things that, that kill us as a, as a society. Um, and so this paper that you're talking about, The Hallmarks of Aging, was published in 2013. And it took these uh, various factions of what was then the aging biology community who were sort of warring with each other about whether this thing or that was the cause of why we aged and declined. And it sort of mashed all of those things together and said, look, it's not just one thing, it's a whole series of things that go wrong in our bodies as we get older that cause our systems to fall apart. And we may need to address, uh, and, and it is possible to address just one of those things and get holistic effects, beneficial effects to an entire organism, but in order to really make a difference and extend lifespan, a healthy lifespan, not just by a few years, but by decades or longer, we're going to have to systematically break down and solve each of these types of damage that are going wrong. And so we don't know yet what the set of interventions will be, right? Whether it's, you know, three things that will uh, enhance human lifespan by, by decades, or whether it's six, or whether it's 10 or more. Um, however, we have a system of working that out by breaking apart all of the different types of molecular damage we've identified that build up in our body, rationally building new medicines around each one of those things to the extent that, uh, to the extent that we know how with small molecule drugs, antibodies, gene therapies, cell therapies, <clears throat> and, you know, the the new the number of modalities for making new drugs is increasing increasing and increasing every year and and then when we get those new drugs shown to be safe and effective in human clinical trials we can then start doing two really interesting things the first is testing whether they can not just treat but prevent a disease in humans so to say slowing our aging which is a new type of trial that the Food and Drug Administration in the US has given their thumbs up theoretically to that type of trial, but no one has started doing it yet. Um, we hope to be one of the first. And then secondly, once you've gotten some drugs that are moving through the FDA as single agents for reducing what I call multi-morbidity risk, which is the same as slowing aging, reducing the risk of getting diseases, then you can start combining those things together to get synergistic uh, benefits to health spend. And so I see this field, it will go through three horizons uh, over the coming couple of decades. First, we're gonna be taking drugs that target the biology of aging, and they're going to get approved for whatever disease that makes the most sense to show safety and efficacy in humans. Then we're gonna see single drugs being tested for their ability to extend health span. And then we're gonna see those health span drugs combined together to look for synergistic effects. And that's how the industry is going to evolve. Uh, and then I guess very final comment there is that the cool thing about biotech is that just the first part, you can make a, a whole industry of really great, really valuable companies just from the first part. And then as you get to the second and third part, you've created an entirely new way of approaching pharmaceuticals. Uh, that will take over the old way that we that we approach medicines development. Thanks so much, James. And I'm going to ask you a question because I mean I know that you're you're approaching this from a from a biotech perspective, and you're talking about sort of the the, the drugs that can attack the basis of aging, the you know the pharmaceuticals. Um, I'm really fascinated. And I know indeed a lot of research at the moment is is fascinating about all the other factors that are responsible for the aging process that are that exist in our wider environment. So new concepts like the exposome, which is you know our body's response to environmental factors like the food that we're eating, lifestyle. You know, activity levels, green space, the housing that we, you know, that we live in, social, you know, all the social sort of wider determinants of health. Um, where do you see the role of pharmaceuticals in the context of all the other factors that have a bearing on how our bodies respond to all these stresses in the environment? Where do you see the balance of, of impact? 
in terms so, of you know your your perspective sure so the the damage that builds up in our bodies as we age is sort of an integrated function mm -hmm. of internal external and what I'll, i can think of as entropic effects right so there's some amount of wear and tear that our body does to itself damage that builds up just if we were completely isolated or in a pristine environment, our bodies would still break down in, in specific and predictable ways. There is the external uh, forces, things that we are eating, things that we are breathing in, pollutants, sun exposure to the skin, which mutates DNA, these sort of external factors. And then there are entropic factors, literally just random changes that happen not that are not caused by the way our, the mechanisms that our body is working are external factors, but still induce damage. And these, this framework of the hallmarks of aging is downstream of all three of those things. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of, you have this integrated function of, I don't care why we're breaking down, but we are breaking down in these specific and predictable ways. And then we develop new therapies downstream of that damage to prevent it from, from accruing or to repair it once it's happened. And in so doing, uh, we can prevent the consequences of that damage. And so, so my view is like I, I don't discriminate between environmental or internal uh, damage that's building up. I think of it as a single integrated function. Mm -hmm. And as far as we know, there are not different categories of damage that happen downstream of external stimuli if that makes sense. Uh, that, that looking at the, the aging body as this integrated function seems to give us a, a good framework for developing new therapies. Fantastic, and I'm gonna explore this in a bit more detail with, with Peter in a second. But my final question to you, James, before we, we go to, um, I know, uh, to Robbie for uh, uh, some other perspectives. Um, uh, how, uh, where, what, is, what are these, what are aging biomarkers? Because uh, Peter had mentioned biological age and how does AI feature in this? Because again, focusing the discussion on how AI and, and data-driven tech is sort of opening up research in this space. How does that all factor? Because it'll, it'll help create the frameworks before we enter into the rest of the discussion. So I'm sure that the four of us could do a whole panel just on this, um, but I will try to be, be brief here and say that in order for this field to deliver on its promise, we must have a measurable way of testing whether a new therapy is working or not. That is you know, beyond just doing a clinical trial where we give a drug to a 40 year old and then see if they get cancer when they're 70 or not. That is an unrealistic feedback loop, right? It would take us too long to determine if any of these drugs are working. And the biomarkers of aging are completely key to that. And so, we have actually a template that the industry is uh, modeling itself off of, which is the statins. So cholesterol lowering drugs were approved in the late 90s and early 2000s, which I would argue are the, the template for how this longevity industry is going to work. You had a drug like Lipitor, which was approved first for a showed safety and efficacy in a rare disease, orphan hypercholesterolemia, and then after it was shown to be safe, the FDA allowed, uh, allowed the company to run a clinical trial for lowering cholesterol and thereby lowering heart disease risk, but approved the drug just from its ability to lower cholesterol. And then it became the best selling drug of all time. And that model is what we're going to use in this longevity space. But we don't have that biomarker yet, that cholesterol equivalent. We have a number of ideas, and I know Pete will tell us a little bit more because he's helping to measure some of these things and actually building the data set that we need. And what's going to happen, I predict, is that we will have a multi, uh, a multi-dimensional data set that we will need to expose to an artificial intelligence. So an AI is really, really good at picking up patterns from fractious data sets and seeing correlations, very strong correlations, where humans cannot. And so we will be building these correlation maps off of these large omics data sets uh, from these different putative, so potential biomarkers of aging, combining those together uh, and coming to the FDA with a set of biomarkers that have very high predictive power, are modifiable by behavior or therapies, and then 
asking them to uh, allow us to approve drugs or get accelerated approval of drugs based on uh, based on changes to those biomarkers. So hopefully we didn't I didn't get too technical there, but that's a critical fulcrum point for this yeah. whole industry. I mean, it's it's massively important because it's the heart of just the explosion that we're seeing right now in this space. So, so thank you very much for for that, James. And I'm going to explore that in a bit more detail with Peter in a, in a minute, in in terms of rooting it in some of the stuff that we're seeing now with that with the technologies available now. Um, so, uh, but before we do that, because you know this the question of this talk was death is just a technical problem, and I know some of you may have heard that you know we'll be able to achieve a more mortality. You know, some of the real gurus and longevity science, you know, have been talking about concepts like longevity escape velocity will be hit, you know, Ray Kurzweil said 2045, you know, the pace of change and expen exponential developments are, are taking place at such a rapid rate that, you know, the scientists will unearth, you know, how we can stop this process. And Aubrey de Grey, who's another very, very well-known um, longevity um, pioneer, you know, saying that actually that's been, that's being brought down. There's a 50% ch chance of likelihood of being able to achieve that, you know, that key to more immortality in 2036. So these are like astounding sort of, you know, uh, uh, um, milestones that are being put in front of us and you know living to 180 people are talking about now uh, you know through research that we know now so this is just like this is like wow this is quite incredible um, but uh, so the pace of change is gigantic and enormous and of course AI is driving a lot of that but just bringing so so Robbie I just wanted to, to talk to you about you know we, we hear about all this but I mean you know how can we bring this discussion back down to earth a little bit, just because we've just coming out of this pandemic. I think people are seeing life differently. We're seeing certainly the healthy longevity field has 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 evolved quite significantly as people have realized how important their health is. Just over to you, just to kind of talk a little bit more about sort of the, the philosophy and and what it means for us as individuals and humanity and mortality. Where to start with so much of that? I suppose um, I'll maybe flag some issues then at, at, a, mm. at a pace which we might then be gathering together with the audience. I suppose some of the big things I would, would talk about, one is about access and inequality. Um, who gets access to this thing? How quickly? Where are some of these clinical trials going to be carried out? Um, you know, I, I, I understand that some of this sometimes feels like the privilege of... <laughs> some very wealthy people in certain parts of the world who get now to think deeply about how do I get to live a lot longer when there are an awful lot of very immediate problems and challenges. And I think one of the things that maybe this space needs to be better at describing, and I think that's probably what Peter is going to do, is to root it in things which are immediate, which are now rather like, you know, you know moonshots created a whole great bunch of things which spread throughout society. What does this start doing now? So my point about feeling on the sort of cuspish sage stage of being sapiens, to think of us as sapiens, as a global species, not just a species rooted in Silicon Valley. What is this going to mean for inequality? What our track record as a species on managing inequalities and equality is pretty poor. Um, and so I, I'm concerned about that as a bucket area. And again, because we've, we've now got our clock up, so I want to go quickly. The other, the other piece I just sort of drop into people's heads is something I think about a lot, which is what is the relationship between our embodied self? So every one of our bodies in this space, sitting on our chairs, breathing, thinking, our biome, our, the bacteria in us, our viruses in us, all of those wonderful complex interactions, our embodied selves our dream time, imaginative selves, those strange liminal space between waking and dreaming, and our digital selves. And I deliberately use digital selves because where we are right now as a species is we are fractured, here we go, fractured epistemes. So I have a bet with my, my children, play a little drinking game with me. How soon does father mention epistemology, ontology, or liminal? And they're normally legless after 10 minutes because three of my favorite words. But if we think about what it means for us to be manifest in data space, every single one of us right now held in ones and zeros, on servers all over the world. Right now, every one of us in a meaningful way is zipping through undersea cables, held in server satellites. What kind of access are we going to get to our digital selves? Who controls this information? We are not, the, uh, um, and I, we are not this bromide 
of there's this comforting thought of a digital twin. There's me, there's my digital twin, is ontologically, I think, a bit of a nonsense right now because we are fractured in data space. We're fractured in data topographies. So I am very aware of time. I don't want to take too long. So I just wanted to drop those two thoughts in. One, which is inequality and access. And the other is thinking deeply about what it means to be instantiated in data space for sapiens right now, and who has access to those forms of data. Those would be my two yeah. contributions for now. Thank you so timing. much, Robbie. I think we have a bit more time from what I understand anyway. So um, so I'm going to take, I'm going to just ask a, 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 um, Peter a quick question just to set the scene. And I've got a couple of hands up and there's some com uh, questions coming up. Can I just have a final time check? I mean, we do have more time, right? Sort of, yeah, exactly. So so we don't actually only have seven minutes. We've got more than that. So just wanted to double check on that. Um, so so Peter, just before, and I've, I can see a few hands raised. I've got a couple of questions here. So. Um, how can we address this question of uh, enhancing access to all the benefits of this research to more people? Robbie mentioned, you know, the health inequalities. We know from COVID, health inequalities have been absolutely horribly exposed, and that is a that links up to, you know, the, the, our, our prosperity, you know, global prosperity. So, um, over to you. How, with what you're doing with humanity, is is uh, attempting to solve some of that problem as well? Because it's not just about living forever; it's about actually living well and healthier for longer, for more people over it's, to you. it's a great question tina and you know one you know i know you're very close to um and for those who don't know uh tina's an, a, an incredible person that adds a huge amount to the space and apart from writing these the, these amazing <laughs> books has also wrote these reports that some uh, that uh matt hancock then approves as saying this is fantastic we need to follow the advice of this report one is the health <laughs> of the nation and one is leveling up health uh, there's a disparity in health span and lifespan just uh, amongst us in the UK. You know, if you live in Blackpool, um, your chance of getting to a healthy old age is much lower than if you live in, say, Berkshire. And in fact, COVID has shown that uh, where, you know, you had like a 350 out of 100,000 dying of COVID uh, or getting infected with COVID and, and being hospitalized versus, say, 90 out of 100,000 in, in the same sort of geographic dispersion. So... We can already give, you know, decades of health span mm -hmm. and lifespan back to people. And we can also increase all of our health span. So I think we have to be radically inclusive about the solutions that we can bring. And and the reason we're humanity as a, as a brand and, and, and a mission is that the, the solution lies with all of us contributing to this problem because we can't solve the problem unless we all uh, play a part. So we already know, however, thanks to the, the, the and we're talking about biomarkers. So I'll, I'll set the scene a little bit on that in case there's questions. But, you know, the biomarkers of aging uh, have been measured through DNA methylation, like looking at the expression of your genes through clinical markers and even digital markers. And that's because thanks to these longitudinal data sets or, or biobanks that have been tracking real world outcomes, who gets sick, who died over many years, and alongside those health records, they were also tracking other things. So some people were wearing accelerometer, accelerometers or uh, they were having their heart rate measured. And of course, now you have that in your smartphone for your accelerometer sensor and you have it in your heart rate monitoring devices, your wearables. And so now we can start looking at these signatures, not a single biomarker, but these signatures, just like when they use the same genetic signatures to identify tumors in cancer, you can look for the same signatures in, oh, we can map you to someone who's phenotypically very similar to you. And we saw that they got sick in say 7.5 years and then died in 10 years. So then we can map you to that person or to those people. And then in, indeed see whether your journey to a, uh, either accelerating your, your disease risk or reducing that disease risk is happening based on the actions you're taking. So we can already do that measurement now, and it's only gonna get more and more predictive as more and more of these models come together, but it's the actions that we're taking that we need to better understand how that's affecting each and every one of us. So the work that you're doing is absolutely fantastic because of course really what this is is about harnessing that data that we are generating in our daily, daily lives. And as the holders of our data, citizen data, which of course Matt Hancock spoke 
spoke about this morning. It's our data, and he is espousing this open approach to harnessing that data, which of course is what we're exploring in the Open Live Data Group work exactly. that I know Peter you're involved in. So we can we can um, uh, we can accelerate all this research and thinking through. Um, um, unearthing new models for data sharing and new business models, et cetera, where data can be harnessed for the public good. These are all the things that we that we need to do and look at. But I'm just going to turn to some questions now. So one of them I'm going to uh, ask to Peter first and then get James to respond. So we have one here. How far can pharmaceuticals go to counter external factors, poverty, stress from work, all the things that, that Robbie had mentioned? Would changing a diet and exercising more be, be enough to counter the damage from these things. So I'm going to ask Peter to talk about that first, um, and then I'll get James to respond as well. I'd love to hear James's perspective <laughs> on this, uh, because one of the interesting uh, stat statistics is on statins, because indeed it's been a huge success story for the pharmaceutical industry. But if you actually look at the real world outcomes of how much of an effect it has on your risk of heart disease or you know uh, the effect of cholesterol on your, on your lifespan, it's like a three and a half percent improvement, which is actually quite huge. But what they don't tell you when you go into the doctor's surgery is that if you move to a plant-based diet, you actually reduce your risk by 50%, mm -hmm. which I'm sure if many of you were told that from a doctor it would be like, okay, well, maybe I'll take both and then I'll increase my odds by a little bit more than 50%. That sounds like a good solution. But no one's saying anything about that. Uh, of course, it's not as straightforward as that, but it's just an example of the effect that, that uh, diet can have. And of course, the same with senolytics, which is one of the hallmarks of aging is senescence, which is the mm -hmm. cells that uh, essentially uh, become non-functional in the body. Uh, and that causes inflammation and then uh, begets mutations and, and so on. And of course, there are drugs looking at removing these senescent cells from the body. But a natural senolytic is exercise and doing a certain amount at certain heart rate levels that can create the, the the moderate level of stress that that helps your body rejuvenate itself so this is you know the stuff that we should be really better understanding purely and simply by virtue of how much of each of these things and, and to which combination should we be doing to optimize our health span and therefore lifespan so james a quick comment there and your views on a composite um aging biomarker that will be the, the holy grail i think for all of us <laughs> researchers sure so <clears throat> My, my direct response to the question is that it's very difficult to measure precisely the damage that comes from you know, stress about work, poverty, the, these sorts of things. We know that they are correlated with poorer outcomes and that it causes, multi, it, it causes and accelerates some of the biological damage that, that Pete uh, just mentioned here. What I would say is that no matter whether we change our exercise patterns or adopt a new diet, those things can give huge benefits respective to you know, how we think about, uh, about the pharmaceutical industry now, like Pete was saying, a 50% risk in heart disease, uh, these sorts of things. But we know pretty damn well that nothing that we can do is going to make it more than 50% likely that someone will make it to 100, right? There's not just like a, a pattern that we can adopt that will give us a good chance of reaching centenarian status. And so when I think about the role that new medicines are going to play in this, it's really to get to that level and beyond. Can we add on to a, a you know, an idealized system of diet and exercise and supplements and all of these other things and build on from that? Because even with a perfect system, we still get cancer, we still get heart disease, Alzheimer's, and, and die Absolutely. in our 80s most likely. And it's it's only by, to your biomarker point, it's only by taking this two-step bridge, making better versions of what a statin tried to be, something that targets all types of the diseases of aging, something at the more mechanistic level, which cholesterol lowering is not, yeah. and then uh, getting the regulators to approve these composite biomarkers. That's how we unlock this. Absolutely. and. Uh, point to mention is that, of course, all this research will hopefully one day unlock the cure for dementia, the most dreaded disease of aging, because, of course, it's all connected with chronic diseases. Now, I've got a question here, and I will also take a question from the audience in a second. We've got about five minutes left. So a question more around, we've got this question, the, the question that we've got, death is just a technical problem. 
but but is it? Because um, we've got a question here, how much does a positive mental attitude have an effect on longevity? So this is around purpose and do we really want to live? <laughs> this is about being human. So I'm just gonna throw that to, to Robbie to talk a little bit about that and also agency and what this is all about from that perspective. Yes, well again, so, so I, I suppose what I, it's this issue, this issue of, here we go, drinking game again, not very healthy. Epistemology, what it means to know and be known. What What's emerging very rapidly for sapiens is we are starting to get to know and understand. Because if I was to ask any one of you right now to run down serotonin, oxytocin, estrogen, cortisol levels, you couldn't do it. But but there there's various this rapidly emerging new form of epistemology out there, which might well know those things about you. And I think that the critical thing is is that that stuff increases agency. So the kind of work that people just, you, 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 you can do something with it. So there's the people who are lucky enough to get access to that kind of information. This might be a bit left field, but the other thing I'd like to throw in is one of the things that worries me a little, the flip side of well-being and well-being industries is it's another thing that people feel that they're missing out on. Mm -hmm. that I don't feel well-being. I'm right now feeling jangled. We, we create the sense of nirvana. So I, I'm aware of time. I'm just going to read you, and it will take me 60 mm -hmm. seconds, because I want it. It's my my favorite poem, and it's the last lines of my favorite poem, and I just wanted to bring it today, by Edward Thomas, the great English poet. And it's slightly sort of left field for today. It says, yet I'm still half in love with pain, with what is imperfect, with both tears and mirth, with things that have an end, with life and earth and this moon that leaves me dark within the door. So my thought about well-being is compassion for messiness too. Compassion for the messiness of our lives, mm -hmm. the complexity, the contradictions, that those things are important to understand for our, paradoxically, for our well-being. That we don't create mm -hmm. this sense of another space where we are as individuals failing yet again. So. I think that that would be my thought about well-being, and I want to stop there because I see it's gone red. So I'm going to take a, um, a question or two from the audience. So, so the question is financial sustainability of the longevity industry. How, how, what are the business propositions that will really take hold? So that's the question. So I'm going to turn to um, uh, to Peter first to answer that question. What's what's your take on that? Um, well, I'll talk in the narrow lens of consumer health. Um, and longevity, uh, because I think there are tried and tested business models. In our case, it's a, a freemium subscription model, and that's actually a very powerful uh, model that that can scale a, a huge amount of impact in the world, like it has in meditation with, say, apps like Calm and Headspace, because it democratizes access to something and turns it into something that that people change their behavior around and then therefore changes their lives. And they make you know a few hundred mi million a year growing at 30% year on year, you know, uh, few, worth a few billion. And they, you know, they're only just getting started. Um, so that's a, that's a way to change, you know, humanity in a positive direction. But there are, of course, many other ways. I mean, if you look at it more in a, a bigger impactful way, if we can understand the data on what's causing us to get sick and we all take action to improve our, our uh, lower our risk, there's no reason why we shouldn't have access to healthcare at a much lower rate, you know, like a Spotify of insurance. And I think that these are the types of offerings that can dis disrupt the current status quo that affects society and makes everything a lot more, uh, you know, preventative as opposed to uh, acute and, and uh, you know, uh, fixing, fixing you when you're sick. So this is about the system change dismantling the whole way that we see health and the system change that underpins that. So I don't know, do we have time for one more question? Oh, one minute. Okay, quick question. So, would you like to ask the question, sir? Yeah. So, the question really I'm asking is about when the Chinese achieve dominance in this field in 2030. Are we looking at the Huawei situation in 20 years ago? <laughs> <laughs> so, that's an interesting question. Well, we, the, the race may be over if, we, if Biden and, and the de democratic world get in on the act <laughs> on AI. But um, so, so, the question is, um, you know, really about <laughs> this is a bigger question on geopolitics um and i don't know whether we've got time to answer that but just a quick um comment uh uh robbie on that <laughs> <laughs> in 10 seconds <laughs> i think the geopolitics of this 
data citizenship, who has access to what, you could well be right. And I think with the answer is I haven't got a clue the way that will play out, but it's a really great question. And that I know kind of takes us up to the 10 seconds. It's a good place to end on a really profound question about the nature of the way different states will respond to these ideas of data, access, transparency, equality. It's a great question. And but, this is... Um, and this is all in the book, by the way, my book, Live Longer with AI. <laughs> so um, all the geopolitics. So I think, um, unfortunately, time is up. I mean, we could go on forever. There are so many interesting questions, both at a scientific, philosophical and business point of, points of view. So thanks to everybody. Thanks to Colgex. Thanks to all of you um, in the audience. Um, thanks to Robbie, James and Peter. And, um, and that's it. Thanks course, so much. Tina. <laughs> thanks, Tina. Thanks, Tina.